Coming up on the Grim Exchange. Witch, please. How have witches been used in storytelling over the last five years? The Wretched directors Brett and Drew Pierce talk about where the charm is in depicting one based on folklore over Christianity. And let's dive into a dodgy 1980s hotel with the team behind Once Bitten as they give us the goods. And we had a little chat with writer Matt Flasby as he introduces his new book, The Anatomy of Fear in Film. This and more on today's episode of The Grim Exchange. fans, I'm Miriam. And I'm Marcus. And this is The Grim Exchange, your one-stop shop for all your horror entertainment news needs. Diving right into it, let's take a look at the latest horror headlines. First off today is the news that Phil Lord and Chris Miller, the duo behind the Lego Movie and 21 Jump Street, are said to be developing an untitled monster movie for Universal Studios. Currently being referred to as Untitled Monster Project, the film is described as a modern day tongue in cheek thriller which is inspired by the classic monster legacy at Universal. There are also plans for Channing Tatum to star in the project. Next up, fans of Stranger Things and Nightmare on Elm Street will be very happy with this next one. It's been confirmed that Freddy Krueger himself, Robert Englund, will be appearing in Season 4 of the Netflix smash hit. Englund will play Victor Creel, a recurring character in the season, who is described as a disturbed and intimidating man who is imprisoned in a psychiatric hospital for a gruesome murder in the 1950s. Now as a gamer, there's no denying that The Last of Us games are some of the best video games of recent times, and it was only a matter of time until a film or TV adaptation would be on its way. Earlier this year, the game was rumoured to be getting an HBO treatment, but now it's been officially ordered by HBO. Craig Mazin, creator of the series Chernobyl, will be developing the series with Neil Druckmann, who is the creator and writer of the games. He'll be on board to write and be an executive producer of the small screen adaptation. The clickers are going to look so amazing in live action form. The first season sounds like it's going to follow the initial story of the game in some form or another. Now another one for gamers to get excited about is the upcoming Resident Evil reboot. And thanks to Twitter account Residents of Evil, we got plenty of set shots to really keep our appetite going. Previously, we'd seen photos of the diner, which featured in Resident Evil 2, but now we're getting shots of the exterior of the Spencer Mansion, as well as a downed Stars helicopter, which featured in the first game. Now, given that the two games are set two months apart, will we be getting flashbacks, or will they be speeding up the time period? We'll just have to wait and see. It does seem to be a year for video game adaptations when it comes to horror. If you suffer from automatonophobia, you might want to look away for this next one, as we're talking Five Nights at Freddy's. Yes, Chuck E. Cheese on Nightmare Fuel. Scott Cawthon took to Five Nights on Freddy's subreddit where he explained the plot of 10 scripts, the final one being titled Mike. He then went on to reveal some bad news. The bad news being that he wasn't going to be working on any more screenplays, as Mike would be the one that he'd be working on going forward. He then went on to add that filming will start in spring. Here we were thinking the bad news was that the whole thing was going to be cancelled. And it is 2020 after all. And finally, the new take on the Wrong Turn franchise has been acquired by Saban Films. The film is being marketed as a reboot of the franchise and as yet has no release date. Wrong Turn will see a group of unlucky friends head to West Virginia to spend a couple of days hiking the Appalachian Trail. Things take a wrong turn, sorry, as they are confronted by the Foundation, a community who have lived in the mountains since before the Civil War, and don't take kindly to strangers. And those were your latest horror headlines. When we think of witches in film, we think pointy hats, warts on the nose, and their association with the devil. But witches in television and film today are not quite the same anymore and have further expanded their symbolism within the horror genre. 
Let's take a look at what's going on in the world of witches and have a chat with the Pierce brothers about the charm of having an evil entity of the wicked kind. <laughs> I've got to work on that laugh. Warning, the next segment contains spoilers for the following films. When it comes to mainstream media, witches have never gone out of fashion, be it The Wizard of Oz, Bewitched, Hocus Pocus, or Sabrina the Teenage Witch, every generation can easily recall a list of iconic characters they grew up watching. The longevity of the witch may be down to the ever-changing way witches are portrayed, and in recent years the popularity of witches on both the big and small screen have seen two very contrasting depictions. A lot of small screen representations of witches surround the coming of age trope, most notably the Netflix series The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, which took a darker and more spiritual route than the original 1990s version of the show. This particular series explores themes of sex, gender, and power, while still managing to throw in a healthy dose of teen drama. Another series that uses the themes but evolved them further was American Horror Story's Coven. Here we followed young witches at a boarding school learning to control and grow their powers, but we also saw the elder generations at the top of their game, experiencing the consequences that come with their power. A recent reboot of the 90s show Charmed has also been gaining a lot of attention for its refreshingly forward-thinking depiction of sexuality and its diverse cast. These women are exploring their abilities and finding themselves in their new roles as witches. Remove this power! All three series showcase witches as eternally young and beautiful, including the more seasoned witches, such as Jessica Lang in Coven, who are equally, if not more so, glamorous and fashionable. This isn't limited to just women. American Horror Story Apocalypse and Sabrina both have male witches, also known as warlocks, who are portrayed in the same light, often with slightly androgynous qualities, playing with gender stereotypes within the witchcraft genre. TV's attractive view of witches gives a much more positive image than the classic green skin and warts from years ago. These witches are compelling creatures and aspiring, intriguing figures to look up to, but also fear. While the witch coming of age trope is nothing new, these modern shows are bringing something more interesting and multi-layered than their predecessors. The struggles of these witches learning to use their magical abilities while living in our mortal world draws parallels to modern day teenagers. The witches are exploring their capabilities, but also their sexuality, challenging gender norms and ultimately finding acceptance in their covens. This represents a welcoming, progressive world that a modern day teen watching only dreams of. Using family issues and witches is common in television, but in movies the dynamics and themes presented are much darker. In The Wretched, we follow a young boy's torment as his parents head towards a divorce and he suspects his neighbor has been possessed by a witch. The witch here is not human. She is representative of something bigger that eats away at relationships, be it people not trusting others or young voices not being heard. Yeah, so when crafting our you know, which story and thinking about, you know, what's the story sort of behind the mythology and the actual scares, it, we, we always sort of talk about what's the, the, what's the sort of element that is actually playing on the fear. What, why are these characters in particular dealing with this creature or this thing? And for us, witches, they're all about, you know, destroying families. They're this anti-mother, this anti-family creature. So for us, we paired essentially a family that's falling apart uh, again, and basically had this kid have to face off with a witch who, you know, is literally ripping his family apart and devouring children. So, and that's sort of like classic with all monsters, I think, is like, you know, Frankenstein's about playing God and, you know, the, the werewolf is sort of this loss of control and animalistic tendencies. And it's always sort of about pairing those themes with whatever creature you're sort of dealing with. So we had found in our research of all the folklore we were looking into, because we based our witch mostly on Black Annie of the UK and the Boo Hag, which is an Appalachian witch here in the US, um, we'd found a, a big commonality in the myths. There was a lot of reoccurring elements like stealing children or wearing the skins of other people in a lot of these. And also in the visual representation of the witch was very similar. And a lot of the drawings and the descriptions of these characters from going from the Baba Yaga to Jenny Greenteeth, all these, 
they all had like crone and hag like creature descriptions of yeah what from they cultures like. all over the world which we thought was really interesting so so when we were sort of crafting our witch we just we decided to sort of merge the aspects so it just kind of made it feel like this rep this witch could represent all of those stories in the witch a family is torn apart by accusations of witchcraft and distrust ending in the demise of an entire family however on the other side of the scale the witch in the window helps bring a broken family closer together in these examples the witch is symbolic of hardships families go through the things that can tear us apart or solidify us Unlike classic films like The Witches and Stardust, where the witch always meets a nasty, conclusive demise, <laughs> modern movies like The Witch and the Wretched leave things open, whether within another guise or their original form. They come back. Having the possibility of her coming back is an interesting way to emphasize that witches are too powerful to be forgotten, and like the issues they represent, may never truly leave us. The darker representation of witches we are seeing more of in cinema is the complete opposite of the stereotypical evil we have come to think of witches to possess. It is more than just the devil that they are serving. It is now another evil. This evil predates what we know of the Christian version of evil and uses more folklore and mythological themes. But why is modern cinema going back to basics and using folklore now? Sometimes what's most terrifying is what's left after we're stripped of technology and our modern way of living. The folklore witch makes mockery of modern society. While we think we're better and invincible, she reminds us we are still human, who all have problems and weaknesses. What I'm really interested in is love. She is the tool in which the audience can fully take the arrogance of society. The past five years have shown us that witches are going nowhere. Like the magical beings that they are, they will continue to evolve, showing audience the true terrors and darkest shadows of our society. She done mess with the wrong witch, and she knows it. And now you know it. And now it's time again to go to my favorite place. It's the Grim Zone! <laughs> Today's Grim Zone is sponsored by Dean of the Dead. Dean of the Dead is producer of the world's most frightfully fearsome hot sauces. All their concoctions are made from combining fresh fruit with some of the world's hottest chilies and with names like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Jeepers Reapers, these bottles are a must-have in any horror-loving kitchen. Lucky for us, Grim Exchange viewers get a special offer. Using the promo code GRIMXMAS2020, you can now get 10% off of the bundle pack, the feared fivesome, and any additional purchases in your order, such as their chili jams or merch. Christmas is sorted this year with Dean of the Dead. So if you want 10% off of the Christmas bundle and any additional purchases, go to this website and type the promo code GRIMXMAS2020. Now, without further ado, I'd like to ask you to turn off the light, crawl under the covers, and get ready for a taste of darkness. <laughs> <clears throat> so we at the Grim Exchange have prepared a little something special for you today. Two sentence horror stories, or what we like to call short scares. The Grim Exchange presents short scares. The sight of my daughter's tiny soft hands always warms my heart. Wish I'd remembered where I'd put her other parts though. It's mesmerizing when he stares into my eyes. I wonder if he knows that it's a two-way mirror. Nervously, she rummaged for the taser in her purse. He should enter the multi-story car park any minute now. The doorbell rings late at night. He took the batteries out of it weeks ago to keep to himself. The moment I laid eyes on them, 
I craved to feel their limbs. All I need to do is hurry through this autopsy and sew them back up again. And there were your short scares. <laughs> Now it's time to hear your short scares. If you've got a terrifying two-liner yourself, leave it in the comments down below or send us a tweet with the hashtag GXShortScare. We'll be picking our favorite ones for the show. Horror as a genre fills us with a vast array of emotions. Whilst we can watch a horror film and feel everything from sadness and anger to joy and love, what we're guaranteed to feel is fear. But how do you get fear in film right? What kind of fears are there, and how do you break them down systematically? Writer Matt Glasby is here to talk about just that, and introduce his new book, The Book of Horror, The Anatomy of Fear in Film. Hi, my name's Matt Glasby. I'm a UK-based film critic. Um, I'm the author of a new book called The Book of Horror, which is an illustrated guide to the scariest films ever made, and it features beautiful black and white illustrations by Barney Bodoana. Now, the idea behind the book is that most horror books or a sort of history of the genre. So with the Book of Horror, the idea was to pick and examine the scariest films ever made. And it's not about whether something's good or not, it's about whether something's scary. And the question is, is how you do that? So to find a way of comparing very, very different films, um, I developed a scale of seven different categories that uh, seven different things that most horror films do to try and scare us. These are Dead Space, The Subliminal, The Unexpected, The Grotesque, Dread, the uncanny, and the unstoppable. And if you take something like, say, the Blair Witch Project, it doesn't have much of the grotesque in it. The grotesque is where we see wounds or special effects or aliens or insects or something just uh, that's abhorrent to us. Um, there's a moment in the Blair Witch Project where there's a bloody tooth, and that's probably the only thing that's actually grotesque in there. But if you take something like Dread, for example, which is the expectation that something bad is going to happen, then uh, the Blair Witch Project is actually full of dread. Even when we can't see what's happening, for most of that film, we get the feeling that something awful is just around the corner, even if we never see it. So there's a huge gap in the market for something that establishes films that are actually scary, gets rid of all sense of importance or box office or anything like that, and actually drills into how and why things scare us. Um, I picked those seven categories as a way of sort of mapping the film experience. One of the things that the book has is infographics which map our experience as if it's like our heart rate of how scared we're going to be at any given moment throughout a film and equally with these seven categories we can tell what kind of film we're going to get so you've got say martyrs or torture porn which is going to be really grotesque um, and you're going to have a real sense of the unstoppable it's going to be really difficult to watch other things are really subtle and have a kind of gently creepy spooky creepiness coming to them like say uh, the innocence that might be a uh, question of uh, slow burn dread, which is a completely different sensation than splatter or sort of a very intense kind of horror. So when it came to trying to sort of get a handle on how horror films work, it seemed bizarre to do that without um, visuals. And obviously the normal visuals that horror books would have would be a poster, and would be stills. We've seen all of these stills before. And actually the idea of having bespoke illustrations gives the reader a real insight into how the horror film might affect them. So I knew the illustrator Barney Bodoano through a friend and asked him to help me um, pitch this book. And then from then, we, we were both hired to the project and he's done a different illustration for each film featured for each chapter. Book of Horror is available from the 22nd of September from all good bookshops and wherever you buy books online. It's published by White Lion Publishing with illustrations by Barney Bodoano. Thanks very much for having me and I hope you like it. Thanks, Matt. Make sure to grab a copy of The Book of Horror, The Anatomy of Fear in Film at your local book supplier or online on platforms like Amazon and Barnes & Noble. We at Grimfest TV love horror films, whether we showcase them on our channel or even at our events. We try to use every opportunity we can to introduce these amazing works of art to you. Now, what's just as exciting as the films themselves are the people behind them, the filmmakers. And we like to use every opportunity we can to just introduce them to you. And so for that, once again, we are going to the infamous Grimfest TV basement. Ah, 
yes, the Grim Fats TV basement. Let's see what's on today. Crap, I don't have a remote. Ah, ah yes, here it is. Wait, what? What's this? What is this? One spin. Oh, and look, the whole team is here. How cool is that? Pete Tomkies, director of One Spitten. How you doing? Hi, Mariam. This is Pete Tomkies from a very hot and sweaty Manchester. Mac Johns, DP of One Spitten. Get out. Hi, Mariam. Oh, God, sorry. <laughs> I said bullshit. I got, I got. Hi, Mariam. Oh, God, everything. Thurston Thompson, the guy behind the sound of One Spitten. What a pleasure to see you here. Hi, Mariam. Lauren Ashley Carter, the actress behind the character and protagonist Martha of One's Bitten. Hello to you. Hi, Mariam. Garth Maunders, the actor behind Dread Volca of One's Bitten. Welcome to my basement. Hey, Mariam. How are you? Tell us about One's Bitten. Once Bitten is a quirky little horror short that's got its tongue firmly in its cheek throughout and it tells the story of Martha Swales alone in her hotel room one stormy night. She's got a problem with the plumbing but she's got another problem in that she thinks the plumber who turned up may just be a vampire. Interesting. So what would you say gives it its unique character? For a film to have a unique character overall it, it, it's a blend of a lot of different things so i mean it's yeah it starts with the script obviously but then pete got this really lovely location the fact that lauren plays the lead thing but you know it feels like it lives inside a horror movie itself the the, the whole movie feels like it belongs in a horror world um and from pete saying that like from a lighting point of view that this hotel was kind of like one of those old you know, it'd be stacks on stacks of, of, of floors in, in like an old New York hotel or wherever. And you've got the neon sign outside. So you've got this kind of warm pink red light coming in from the outside. Um, you can imagine it's raining outside, the lightning flashing through. It's just, I don't know, it kind of, you know, when thinking about the world that exists outside of that hotel room, I always think of it as something that looks like taxi drive. So it just all feels very analog, if that makes sense. Its unique character comes from Pete's love of the genre. He knew what he wanted to make. Um, Lauren was perfect in casting for it. The realization of this little location as a hotel room, a one location movie, all these little hints um, and little sort of homages to other genre films. Um, yeah, it's got a real old school analog sort of vibe to it. And, and I just love that. Hmm. Thurston, do tell me, what was your approach overall in regards to the sound? Uh, I worked in a slightly unusual way for me. I, I don't usually work with other people when I'm composing, but I got my good friend Yan Weng Ho on, who's from a very much a classical background, and I am not. And therefore, the sort of mashing of my sort of noisier distortion compared to her much nicer playing, um, I think worked quite well in the end. Lauren, was the role physically demanding? As a matter of fact, it was very relaxing, actually, because I got to lay in the bed for quite a good amount of time before Garth comes in as his vampire character. And nobody ever asks me that, actually. I, I have a few scenes in films where, where I'm laying in a bed, and any time that an actor is laying in a bed, just assume they've been laying in that bed for hours, and it's pretty great. Uh, later on in the bathroom scene, I do a lot of screaming. And I had to do a lot of screaming, and I think that that made up for all the all the bedtimes. Now I've heard some very exciting insights, very compelling indeed. But let's see if uh, if a teaser could get me a little more excited. Hello, I'm your host, Sir Dickie Benson, and welcome to the show that dares to debunk. The dark tales of urban legend. They said the repair guy was ill. As we ask, is it horror? <laughs> or hokum? Now let's go to my personal favorite part. Hit me with some fun facts. Fun fact. 
We did not film Once Bitten in a 1980s New York hotel because there aren't many of those in South Manchester. We did that film in an 1830s railway building, uh, which was right next to the Metrolink tram system in Manchester. So to give it that full ambience of the, uh, the trains rumbling around outside, just as if we really were in New York. Fun fact, because of the location, we were next to an active tram line and trams were still going past every eight minutes on the Oldtingen line. Uh, which made the filming interviews really, really difficult. Fun fact, Garth Maunders, who played the caretaker in the film, had had major surgery a couple of days before he stepped into the role. So he came to set on some pretty strong painkillers, but he showed up and did it nonetheless because he's an actor who has grit and he's just a good, good person. Fun fact, I don't actually really remember much about the set that day. I uh, don't remember much about the script because I've never read it before that day. And I don't remember about pretty much anything that happened. There was a lot of painkillers because I'd just come out of hospital the day before. I turned up on the set and I was given a script, put into a costume, put into makeup and ushered onto set. And uh, don't remember any of it. Fun fact. This is my cat Scout. And you can hear her in the soundtrack as the noisiest eater in the world. Fun fact, when I was in the bathroom, I had to do some shadow acting uh, and Pete was directing me from the outside of you know, turning on a light and hitting something and I couldn't see my shadow. So he was telling me what to do so that it would look a certain way, but I didn't know what it looked like. It was trickier than you would think. Now, as we've established, Garth, you were kind of in and out of consciousness, to say it politely. <laughs> What memories do stand out for you when you think back on the production? So I remember the fake blood. I remember Pete getting overly excited and it just going everywhere, literally. I don't really know why I remember that. Maybe I just have a weird sense of humor, but blood here, there, everywhere, doors, walls, floors, everywhere. And that's kind of seared into my brain now. So yeah, thanks Pete. Well guys, it's been absolutely amazing to say the least. Please stop by our basement sometime soon and have a lovely day. Uh, thank you for having me on, Mary. It's been brilliant to, to come talk about the film and speak to you. And what the? Oh. Bye, Mary. Thank you. Help me. Please help me. Thanks, Mary. Bye. Thank you. It was a pleasure being on. Bye bye. Please, somebody. Goodbye. And there you have it, today's episode of The Grim Exchange. Make sure to support the horror industry by watching films, playing games, and reading books. As per usual, don't forget to check out the rest of Grimfest TV. Our channel offers extended interviews and the works of independent horror filmmakers. Special thanks to our sponsors, and see you next time on The, the Grim, Grim Exchange. Exchange.